All right, well, we're going to get going here. Uh, we might have some people trickling in still, but um, as they come in, we can just uh, say hello to them in the chat and they can jump right in with us. Uh, my name is Dave Watson. I'm the Regional Account Manager for Western Canada here at CCI Learning. Uh, welcome to our webinar series on Jasper Active uh, Digital Literacy. This is what our agenda is going to look like for the day. Um, so we're going to do some welcome and introductions, uh, the libraries and digital literacy uh, landscape, and then we're going to move into global digital landscape uh, with Catherine Devine, who's a guest speaker that we're delighted to have from Microsoft today. Um, and then we're going to go into Jasper Active Digital Literacy and free lesson deep dive, where I'll actually walk you through what Jasper Active for Digital Literacy looks like, and you'll get a bit of a better understanding of what it's about and how it works. And then at the end, we'll open it up for questions and answers. Um, obviously, if you have some questions during the uh, presentation that you want to ask right away, uh, you can type it into the chat and we will have some CCI learning um, colleagues of mine that will be moderating the chat and they can actually answer the questions as they come. Or, of course, you can wait till the end and you can ask uh, out loud and, and uh, we will go over those as well. Um, just some housekeeping to keep in mind here. Please mute your microphones. I know with everything going along right now, a lot of us are working from home. Um, so if you could mute your microphones, that would be great, just so that we don't have too much background noise going on. Um, I will be moderator moderating the uh, slideshow today as well. So um, Catherine, just keep in mind that uh, I will be controlling the slides as well as Vanessa. Um, so as you would like to uh, move forward with the slide, if you want to just give me uh, an OK or you're ready and I will move along with you. Uh, and then, you, of course, use the Teams chat for any questions during the presentation. So how many of you have heard of CCI Learning before? Hopefully some of you. Um, and if not, uh, this is sort of the background of CCI Learning. Uh, we've been in business for 30 years. Um, we started as a courseware publisher where we were just um, publishing uh, your, your basic textbooks. Um, but as obviously the world has moved to a digital sort of economy, we've shifted our biz uh, business to software development as well as uh, certification for our primary focus. And sort of this is our mantra at CCI Learning. Um, and this is our sort of belief system that we apply to everything that we do. Um, every lifetime deserves to be maximized. Uh, empowering students with future ready skills is of the utmost importance and learning needs to be engaging. So we want learners to work hard and reach their potential and every student deserves a fair and equal chance to succeed uh, no matter what their learning style is. Obviously every student's learning style is different and they react differently two different styles of learning. Uh, and with that in mind, we work with educators to help inspire excitement in the classroom through hands-on learning. Um, and we believe that empowering students with future ready skills is of the utmost importance. We really, really believe that. Um, so how do we help students maximize their ex learning experience and prepare them for career or educational advancement? Um, and I think we can all agree that learning needs to be engagement, engaging and we need to embrace new ideas um, and meet students where they are. Uh, and sometimes that means challenging the status quo. So we need to uh, show students that learning can be exciting. And we believe that through the development of vocational skills and these certification skills um, and industry certification, that we're providing one of uh, the many ways to make that a reality. Uh, so this is who is joining us today from our team at CCI Learning. Um, again, my name is David Watson. I'm the Regional Account Manager for CCI Learning for Western Canada. Um, Lexi Wynn is our Sales and Marketing Coordinator at CCI Learning. Uh, Uzair Khan is our Marketing Manager. Uh, and Vanessa Knox is our President and COO. And then, of course, we're delighted to have Catherine Devine here, who is the Worldwide Education uh, Global Business Strategy Leader for Libraries and Museums from Microsoft. So that's uh, really, really great to have her here today, and she's going to go over some really, really cool stuff. And now I will hand it over to uh, Vanessa, my president and COO, to talk about libraries and digital literacy. Thank you, Dave. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Vanessa. Um, and um, I'm honored to be here today with you all. 
Uh, I think as we discuss sort of the digital divide and digital literacy, uh, it's super important that we understand uh, the definition of what digital literacy is. So UNESCO um, has a, a great definition of digital literacy, and basically it's the ability to access, manage, understand, integrate, communicate, and evaluate and create information safely and utilize that information regardless of where you are. Uh, so uh, Dave, if you want to go to the next slide, that shows the uh, text heavy definition of digital literacy uh, that was provided uh, by UNESCO. There's multiple ways to define digital literacy uh, and I've highlighted here the key features. So access, manage, understand information, integrate information, communicate information, evaluate information and create information safely. So if we look at digital literacy today versus 10 years ago, if you want to go to the next slide, please, Dave. I think there's a, a clear definition um, and distinction between even just in the last 10 years, where right now a digital divide is created by the data, the division in data and access to data. The ability to understand information that is fake and information and news that is fake and real. The ability to be able to search online safely, find accurate, authenticated information and then apply that to any decision that's being made in your life, regardless of whether you're a student in elementary school, high school, a learner, regardless of whether you're a digital citizen, just ensuring that you're able to integrate effectively into society. Keeping in mind that in 2020, the digital natives are now the teachers and as such are applying innovative and um, uh, new ways of learning and integrating information. The demand for high order thinking is super important because it's not just about learning how to use the various and multiple technologies around the world, but it's why and when to use them that is equally, if not more important. And of course, the proliferation of places to learn. And in 2020, that has changed significantly with regards to COVID. So whereas bricks and mortar buildings are very, very important and will never go away, it's important to understand that we all have an opportunity and a responsibility to ensure that regardless of where the learner is, we need to make sure that the information is available to them where they are. So uh, next slide, please, Dave. There is a digital inequality today, so we know the rate of technology is exponential. The change, the change is happening constantly. And we're also, uh, we're also faced with new types of crimes, cybersecurity th crimes, threats to security, threats to data. In many countries, we have an aging population. And what that means is people are retiring later, and perhaps those people weren't brought up with the digital skills necessary to be successful. Youth unemployment is growing and more and more so in today's age. We have a big problem with unemployment globally and employers need to ensure that the people within the organizations have multiple and diverse skill sets in order to be productive in the environment that they're faced with. Next slide, please, Dave. So we identified quickly in our um, in the years with CCI learning sort of three key areas um, with regards to um, sectors, if you will, that need to have 21st century skills. So in order to equ equip people with the necessary skills. So schools, of course, we know all of the students have to have the necessary skills to be able to learn online, to be able to use technology, to be able to integrate technology. We know that corporations and workforce development have those needs as well in order to be more productive and for, from a corporate perspective, uh, really, if you have somebody that is proficient in technologies, they're going to reduce training time and they're going to increase productivity and profits. And we know corporations like that. Seniors is an area uh, that uh, sometimes uh, gets forgotten and I think it's really important to understand with an aging population um, that uh, all of us have access to the technologies for various reasons. 
So seniors, it might be important for them to stay connected to close family and friends. It may be important for them to be able to reach out into our wild, wide world web and find the information necessary. And the statistics are overwhelming. We have 90% of the workforce say that basic computer skills are a requirement. 72% of seniors say they need assistance learning and learning how to use modern technologies. And 94% of employers say, sorry, 94% of employees stay longer if their company invests in learning. Next slide, please, Dave. So that's great, but I believe, and I think we all believe here, um, including, um, and I'm so excited that Catherine's decided to join us, including Microsoft, believe that the library is a place that needs to be accessed. The library sector and the connection that the library sector has to their patrons and the community and their citizens is a very, very important service that can be offered. So got a couple of uh, sort of engagement questions here, hoping you guys will play along with me. Uh, how many public libraries are there globally? So let's get you typing your answer in the chat. Let's see if we can just take a stab at it without using the internet to find the answer. So how many public libraries do we believe that there are globally? Let's see if we can get a, a quick stab answer at that in the chat. And uh, I'll, give you guys, um, I'll give you guys maybe 30 seconds or so to get, uh, to get that answer in and drum up some, some um, excitement around this. And I'll explain why in a second. Okay. Okay, so we've got some some people answering here. That's fantastic. So there are over two hundred and thirty thousand public libraries globally. Think about that for a minute. Two hundred and thirty thousand public libraries. And in the U.S., over ninety percent of the population, over ninety percent of the population live within a public library service area. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the library is a resource that the community can tap into to learn. Next slide, please. OK, next one, next one. So we had uh, four people answer that one. And according to my chat window, if my, uh, if my connection is good, uh, let's see if we can go for more now. Uh, so next fun fact, which city has the most libraries per capita. Which city in the world has the most libraries per capita? Let's take a guess. Awesome, great answers coming in there. Okay, drum roll please, Dave. Edinburgh, Scotland. So Edinburgh is a city of uh, about uh, half a million people and it has over 300, 300 libraries. That's 60 libraries per 100,000 people. So that means it has a, 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 an abundance of resources available for that city. I found that quite interesting. I see some of the other answers in the chat. I see Washington, D.C., I see New York, I see London. Excellent, excellent guesses. But Edinburgh, Scotland, which is a relatively um, uh, small country, of course, with only sort of five or six million people, and yet in a city of 500,000 people has over 300 libraries. I found that quite fascinating. Next slide, please, Dave. So we know Libraries come in all shapes and sizes. Whether it's the Doctor Who style box in the middle, whether it's the quaint uh, rural, rural library serving a, a very, very small population, or whether it's the zebra striped building, powerful and architecturally strong. They come in all shapes and sizes. However, in my opinion, next slide, please, Dave. Libraries are not just buildings. 
The libraries serve a vital community service. They're responsible for connecting patrons in person and online to resources that aid to improve lives. They can increase employment opportunities with value added programs, whether it be basic literacy or whether it be digital literacy. And one of the things I find most ironic is every time I visit a library and very often when I was young, you would hear shh, and yet the libraries have such a powerful community voice. Ensuring that community members are competitive with the latest in technology skills and providing vital sustainability and the ability to improve local economic development. I see libraries as a way to bridge, bridge the local communities with whether it be technology, whether it be uh, digital literacy learning, whether it be working with uh, local homeless shelters, Every patron within the community, everybody should have access to all of the resources. And libraries are starting to reinvent themselves. We know they're underfunded. Uh, we're all uh, hoping they get more funding, but there's a way to make sustainable programs by partnering um, and creating agreements with local school districts, by partnering and recognizing the need to have employment programs in their local communities. And I think it's a it's an area of uh, of our ecosystem that um, needs to have more attention. And I believe Microsoft believes that too, given that they have appointed Catherine Devine um, as a whole area in libraries and museums for Microsoft. I hope you'll join us as we start to partner with libraries and start to connect libraries with local school districts, partnering with employment services and employment agencies and help us empower libraries and librarians to be the vital community service that we believe and I know they believe that they are. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Dave. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That was really great. Uh, a lot of really, really great information and stats in, in that presentation that um, really are uh, shifting everyone's focus towards that uh, and, and bringing the best out of these partnerships. And now I would like to um, hand it over to Catherine Devine uh, to talk about li libraries, digital transformation and the digital literacy. Uh, Catherine, welcome and uh, good luck. Thanks so much, Dave, and uh, thank you so much, Vanessa, for inviting me. I, um, I'm really thrilled to be here with everyone today. Um, I see lots and lots of people on the chat from South Africa, so that's um, that's great. Um, I'm sure there are people from all over the place, but um, that, that's really interesting to me. I, I really have um, a you know, a fascinating role. I, um, before COVID, um, you know, my life was uh, visiting museums and libraries around the world. And um, I have to say that's certainly one of the uh, the better jobs of my career. But, um, but Microsoft is, you know, started a focus two years ago on uh, museums and libraries. Um, and my role is to is to sort of be at Microsoft and think about what are the needs of museums and libraries globally? Um, what are the trends? How can we best support them? Um, what are they trying to achieve? How do we help them achieve their missions? You know, what is the best way to do that? Um, and uh, and with that, we um, we're going to talk today about literacy and, and digital literacy, but just you know, generally skills literacy, um, and some of the work that we're doing in this uh, in this field. We're delighted to be working with CCI Learning. They're an important global training partner for us um, here at Microsoft. Um, and, um, and so I just want to sort of give you a sort of insights into sort of how we think about libraries and museums, how we're committed to them, how we think about the digital divide, how we think about digital literacy uh, and the role that libraries um, have to play. Um, before we move on to the next slide, I, um, I just want to um, talk a little bit about my own experience um, in uh, with the uh, libraries during uh, COVID. I uh, when I, I came into this role with um, with a background in museums, 
and um, and so libraries are not necessarily new to me, but they're they definitely um, it did not as much depth as I had with museum as I had with museums. And um, the librarian community really welcomed me into this role. And I must say, they are some of the loveliest people in the world. And I'm not buttering people up here, um, but they really are some of the loveliest. And I think we saw that through COVID. Um, I was amazed where other organizations and other industries very much went into um, lockdown, you know, like we all went into lockdown, but went into this, you know, we need to close, right? Um, libraries did that, but they also really embraced, you know, I heard some amazing heroic stories of um, librarians who actually little rang everybody in their community and, and then literally drove books and resources out to people who were at risk in the community or people who, um, you know, just to continue providing that service in any kind of way that they can. And I think this really speaks to the importance that libraries have with the with the, the larger community and really demonstrated, always demonstrated, but demonstrated through COVID. So we can move to the next slide, Dave. So um, I'm not going to, this is a bit of an eye chart, I'm not going to go into this, but I want to just want to sort of highlight to you how we think very holistically at Microsoft about the opportunities for digital transformation, which is digital transformation to me is how can we reach new audiences? How can we um, find new ways to engage? How can we do anything that we need to do to further our mission um, through the use of technology? So it's not coming from a how do we use technology, um, but much more from a uh, how do we help libraries uh, achieve what they want to achieve and how can technology help them achieve it uh, better, more ways, all these kinds of things. So I want to highlight to you here in the green in the top um, is um, enhanced visitor experience. And we have a triangle here around education and community. And I very much see the work around skilling and uh, literacy as falling into this area for libraries. But the point of this objective is to help, help you understand the breadth of work that we're doing in the library space. So everything from the advanced discovery area, which is, you know, how can we help discoverability of collections? Um, how can we help um, people find what they need to do, whether you're a librarian, whether you're um, a, uh, a community member? All the way through down to in the bottom orange, in the bottom left are orange is just efficiencies in running the organization and then in environments on the on the bottom is you know everything from like smart buildings how can we maintain environment sustainability so the objective of here we're going to talk about education and community but i want to help you people understand the breadth that microsoft looks at this space globally and um and wants to sort of um really sort of add value back into the into uh into this community in terms of uh, recognizing its mission so if we could move to the next slide, Dave. So one of the things that we really um, are very concerned about at Microsoft, um, it may surprise you that Microsoft is concerned about this, but we are because um, our mission is, we, we see ourselves very much as a mission-driven organization as well, certainly not in the same way that museums and libraries are, but our mission is how can we help everybody on the planet achieve more? And that's not to suggest that they don't achieve enough already, but sometimes there are constraints that that limit people in achieving uh, everything that they can. So this digital divide, uh, we all know that this is really important. I'm, I'm, I realize I'm sort of preaching to the choir here. Um, it used to be that technology or access or an understanding of technology was um, a nice to have. And I am someone who grew up, actually went to school in the 1970s, and 60s, and um, and when I left school, actually when I left university, we still didn't have computers. I grew up in Australia, and we still didn't have access to personal computing. And I sort of feel like I um, I got into computers um, literally in the mid 80s in 19, in Australia, um, which is when personal computers um, and that was a that was a major transformational um, sort of like moment. But if you went to school before that, you didn't have any of this experience. And it was very much, um, it was out of reach. I mean, computers were tens of thousands of dollars, personal computers. Um, actually, my, my career started in mainframes, which was totally out of reach for anybody. Um, and then in the 90s, the internet came along 
And, and again, that was out of reach because there was a very big technical hurdle to actually access the internet. Like you actually needed, you didn't need to code, but you certainly needed to understand network communication protocols and things like this. But and so for a long time, we have treated technology as being um, a nice to have. It's for the people who are like Catherine and others in the world who really love technology and love playing with new things. But those days are well and truly gone. And now we have this very unfortunate um, scenario where these are critical that the work, accessing services in life, access, navigating your life requires you to both understand and have access. And this is not true for everybody, including in developed countries. And it is really quite amazing how much in developed countries, the um, the uh, these things are not available to everybody, but it's affecting the overall education and, um, and the ability to just navigate your life. And so we see libraries um, globally in the business of like, making Wi-Fi hotspots available, making laptops available. Um, we saw a lot of that during COVID, people literally like doing curbside service and getting everything out of their libraries to be available to the community. We see rural broadband, um, actually just broadband access globally is a real issue because um, the world, particularly the content coming out of the United States, assumes a certain level of, of internet throughput that doesn't exist everywhere. And I know personally from my own experience in Australia, um, when I go to Australia, I just, I cannot assume that I have the same level of throughput that I have in, in, um, in um, the United States, for example. And so we are inadvertently limiting people um, through this. And Microsoft has done a lot here in the rural broadband space. Um, and then let's get on to the, this idea of digital skills. Um, so, how can museums, uh, not museums, sorry, libraries, how can libraries help the community in just understanding? Because we've, we've found that, you know, even basically applying for, if you're someone who's like my age, who went through school through that system or older, um, you may find yourself at a stage in your career where you can no longer, you know, maybe you work, you trained in a trade and you're a forklift driver. Um, those roles have been automated and and now you need to find a role, but even to get, you know, a minimum uh, wage job at something like uh, working for McDonald's, you need digital skills to be able to apply for those roles. So libraries have been key. And as Vanessa said, um, you know, there are 230,000 of them in the world. Apparently I was wrong. I said 100,000. There are 230,000 of them in the world. Um, they're important parts of that community. Um, and then, of course, with COVID, we've seen this movement towards digital program delivery. I'm really excited about this because inadvertently, by focusing on brick and mortar, we have unintentionally um, limited access. Uh, and there are lots of reasons why people don't have access. They may not have access to transportation. They may be disabled. Um, there may be lots of things. But digital program delivery is a way to reach the community. Um, and, I, and so I think during COVID, we saw a lot of embracing of this. We saw major libraries doing um, things like, you know, basic computer literacy delivered over the internet um, in a way that, you know, um, I know personally, I actually attended an event last night that was driven by the State Library of New South Wales. Um, I'm currently based in Seattle in the US. New South Wales is in Australia. I uh, actually can't get there at the moment. Um, but the point is I could actually attend an event and um, and it was super interesting. It was, it, it, I think we've underestimated how much digital program delivery uh, limits um, by having it in a brick and mortar building has limited our audience. And so even people like myself can really get in touch with the culture that I grew up in um, and learn the interesting things about Australian history. So next slide. Um, so, this idea of digital skills, I just want to sort of go, you know, deeper on that. And so we've seen Microsoft um, has recognized with um, with COVID that, you know, with any major change in any country or in the world, we see um, pivotal change happening. And the roles of yesterday, the work, the workforce roles, firstly, we've, we've got massive unemployment uh, globally and people need to retrain. And so Microsoft has invested significantly in that and in uh, facilitating that through um, 
through libraries as well as through through other channels, uh, including places like LinkedIn Learning and, and things like that. But we're very, very dedicated to this idea of skills and um, how can we help them? And these are not just skills in technologies or how to code, but this is just like life skills. How can I navigate the world? How can I apply for unemployment? How can I apply for any of these kinds of things? And um, as well as just digital skills, like, you know, how do I, um, how do I do and digital skills does not have to mean coding, right? We do tend with technology to think that it's coding um, is is everything there is. And if you're not a coder, you, you don't need to understand technology. But we have a very large proportion of the population who um, are uncomfortable. And then we tend to stereotype on generational lines of seniors have it challenging, but young people um, are fine and that's not necessarily true as we know so it's like how can we make this available in the absence of others and then of course just developing new skills for workforce and we're seeing an increasing trend and in conversation happening in in education around micro credentialing and this idea of continuous learning throughout your life and throughout your career and no longer the idea of it certainly from the days when I was at school which is you know you go to you go to high school and then you go to a trade um, or you go to university and then you're done. And uh, and so even at my late stage of life, I um, not maybe not that late, but anyway, stage of life, you know, recently um, um, did a master's degree. And um, but this idea of having to, you know, continuously keep our skills going. And I am also at Microsoft. We are encouraged um, to keep our own technical skills up to date. And so I'm always going through that. But with this is something that now needs to be available to everybody, not just the privileged. And so uh, we're very excited to be partnering with CCI Learning. We're very committed to this um, and, um, and very interested in, in how we can um, help support digital literacy um, throughout the world. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all. I'm going to stay on and listen because I'm really interested um, and I'll take any questions at, um, at whatever point we do questions in this. Thank you. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so thank much you for that, that, Catherine. That, that was very interesting and it would be great if you could uh, stay uh, on to the end yeah, of I'll your be too, in, in case anyone has any questions for Catherine at the end. So next, we're actually going to do a bit of a deep dive into Jasper Active Digital Literacy as the product, and we're going to look at exactly what it is and how it functions. Um, we've got a video here that I'd just like to play. Uh, please let me know in the chat if, if anyone is unable to hear the audio on this. Dave, no audio. So just give me a second. I had something just pop up on my screen as well saying the audio is not working for a second. Just give me a second here. Just going to quickly unshare and then reshare this uh, screen just because the audio is not uh, seems to be not working here. So just give me a second here. All right. Let me know if this is working for everybody. Are you tired of technology making your head spin? Is it causing you frustration? Mm. Things just aren't going how you want them to, and they seem more difficult than they need to be. Maybe even just makes you want to scream. Technology is a key part of the workforce and life today. Whether you are an engineer, a mechanic, a teacher, or simply just filing your taxes. We don't want technology to cause you to fret. We want you to be able to use it as a tool. Well, never fear. 
Jasper Active Digital Literacy is here to take away those stresses and make using technology a simple task, walking you through it every step of the way. It is mobile ready and can be accessed anywhere, anytime. Jasper Active Digital Literacy is mapped to Certiport's IC3 Digital Literacy Certification to ensure that you have the technology skills that you require for success. The platform was built so that users of all ages with varying levels of knowledge and experience can easily navigate their way through Jasper Active Digital Literacy. All graphics have been made to be clean and simple so that users are clear on what they are being asked to do. Jasper Active Digital Literacy is built with various learning styles in mind as the learner goes through the program with audio and visual aspects. Three courses are offered in Jasper Active Digital Literacy, Computing Fundamentals, Living Online, and Key Applications. Key Applications gives insight into the most common office productivity applications, touching on topics such as working with documents, spreadsheets, presentations, and basic data sheet concepts. Computing Fundamentals allows learners to gain a foundational understanding of computing. Topics such as mobile devices, hardware devices, file sharing, and cloud computing are addressed. Finally, Living Online introduces concepts such as social media, online conferencing, streaming, and digital citizenship. Jasper Active Digital Literacy enforces that whether you are a young person just beginning to use technology, or if you are a senior who has never been introduced to technology until now, Jasper Active Digital Literacy will help you become digitally literate. Log in to Jasper Active at app.jasperactive.com and start your free lesson today. Happy learning! And start awesome. your free so that, uh, that sums up sort of what Jasper Active is about and how it works and how it sort of uh, looks when you're in the app. I'm actually going to uh, go through the app now and sort of show you exactly how it works and how it responds for the free lesson. Um, Jasper Active for Digital Literacy, what we've done recently with this is that we've made it uh, vendor neutral so that it can be accessed on any mobile device. Uh, this was really, really big for us as um, sort of technology competes against each other and, and continues to expand. Uh, there's all these different devices coming out. So Chromebooks, um, Apple has their devices, Microsoft has their devices. So it was really important for us to make this a browser based solution so that all of these devices would work for Jasper Active. Um, so that's what we have. We can uh, access it from any mobile device. Uh, and sort of this is the instructional design methodology behind Jasper Active. So this is sort of how it's broken down um, in parts. Um, it starts with a benchmark exam, which is a timed formative assessment of skills done uh, uh, at the outset of learning. So when a student or a person um, signs into Jasper Active, the first thing they're prompted to do is a benchmark exam and it assesses where their skills are at so that they can um, sort of build a learning pathway based on how they do on the benchmark exam. Um, lessons are delivered through projects differentiated by level. So as uh, a learner um, a, moves through Jasper Active, the multiple levels of complexity, they're going to see all of that, um, which build on the learner's knowledge as they go. Um, there's case study, study scenarios that are based on real world um, problems to engage the learner and provide relevant, uh, meaningful context. Um, and, and then, of course, it's reinforced with questions that are, are really hammering home the comprehension that's being taught to the learner. Um, it has practice tests um, that ensures the learners are ready to take the certification exam. So it, is, it assesses all the skills that they've learned throughout the Jasper Active portions. And then, of course, the learning library is just additional resources, um, including quick decks for key terms and definitions, um, as well as a full ebook of our courseware. Uh, so now I'm actually going to sort of go right into the actual product. So I'll open up a web, web browser here. And I know there's a couple Microsoft reps in the uh, in the presentation. Please don't get mad at me for using Chromebooks. You go right to the jasperactive.com uh, homepage here. You'll see this pop up. Um, Jasper Active for Digital Literacy is right here on the front page. Uh, 
So if you click learn more on the Jasper Active for Digital Literacy page, um, it'll pull you to this page for the free lesson. All you need to do is go here, click here, and then it's gonna launch you into exactly what you need to do to set up an account to go through this free lesson. Um, so you go to new register or new user register here. I've already set up a dummy account, but I will just click this just so you see uh, how it works and what it looks like. Uh, learner student is what you'd wanna click. Um, and then it's gonna ask you for your date of birth. Um, once you click your date of birth, I mean, I could just type it in. I'll just click anything here to uh, push through. Um, it, it's gonna ask you to sign up with a username. So then you click this. This is just basic information that it's asking for, your first name, your last name, um, your username. You can, uh, you can set up a username so that it's easy access when you log in. Um, it's gonna ask you for your language preference, your country or region, very basic um, information about you. Uh, once you've done all this, you can click next group. You, if you have a study group code that's created through an organization and it's emailed off to you, you can punch that in and it'll actually uh, put you into whatever group that's set up for you. Um, but for this, for uh, all case and purposes here, you would just go next step once you've created all this information and it's just gonna click, uh, bring you to another uh, basic information page. It takes about two minutes to set up an account. Uh, I'll just log into the account that I've set up so that you can actually see what happens once you've um, set up your account. So this is me signing in for my account. Um, this is what everything's going to look like when you get in. Um, this is what the free trial looks like. So there's a few questions. Um, there's a few lessons. Uh, challenge the benchmark. I'll open up the benchmark just so you get an idea of what it looks like when you go in. So once you're into the benchmark, there's a couple of uh, instructional videos that um, sort of give you the questions and the answers here. Uh, which quick clip shows you how an internet call works? So that's the question. So you can watch- Internet clips. calls work over a protocol called SMS. It is also used for text messages and regular phone calls. So that's one of the um, questions or the Internet answers. calls from apps such as Skype, WhatsApp, and Viber work over a protocol called VOIP or VoIP. It connects multiple compatible devices together using IP addresses, connecting to a server in the cloud. So now you're gonna guess which answer it is. Say you wanna say B, uh, you would move on then with next question. So that's how you work through these. All these um, clips give you uh, a basic um, answer for what you're trying to look for for the question. So which quick clip shows the correct process to add a photo to a Twitter profile? So all these videos show a different uh, response and then you have to choose which one you think is correct. Uh, so I'm just gonna click another random one just so you understand how it works. So this is how you move through the benchmark. So that you can see up here questions, tells you how many questions. So this is question three of 74. Uh, once you complete the benchmark exam, once you go through it, you can exit out and it's gonna score that exam for you right away. So I'm not gonna go through all 74 questions obviously because you sort of get a basic understanding of what it looks like and how it works. So I'm going to exit out. Once I exit out, um, it would. if you finish the exam, it's going to score it for you. Um, and then I'm just going to show you some of the free lessons that are available after the benchmark exam. So it comes with the study project one and two here for social media. These are sort of what you're going to be looking at uh, when you see the uh, study project. So social networks have changed the way we communicate on a personal and professional level. They allow us to interact with people in different parts of the world and create content and share it and spread it. So it's giving you a bit of a case study here. And then it's going to ask you questions on these key elements and concepts surrounding your case study. So you can actually click the concepts and it's going to tell you just exactly what they are, the definition of these concepts which is really great for learners that um, might not know what cyberbullying concepts are. Um, there's a lot of basic knowledge here that we take for granted, but if you've never had the exposure to it, um, you would never know. So this is exactly what these um, 
are showing the concepts. You can look through it. It's based right off of our courseware that we published. So like I said at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we started as a courseware publisher. We still have all those um, basic courseware um, publishers. We've actually moved it into our Jasper Active and digital learning. So here's the question now. Um, it gives you a case study scenario. Uh, not all content needs to be shared everywhere and not all content is suitable for every social media platform. So this sort of gives you a basic understanding of what these media platforms are. And then the question is which, the, which or watch this quick clip and determine which social media platform to use for the answers below. So it's going to ask you to watch this video. Ethan has made a video on how to repair wooden furniture and can't decide which social media site to upload it to. Should Ethan upload the video to YouTube? LinkedIn, Instagram, Snapchat, or Twitter. Afterwards, viewers will be able to subscribe to or follow Ethan in order to be notified when he uploads new videos. So it's asking you what platform would he be loading this up to, um, and then it gives you all of the answers here. Uh, I'm just going to click it and check my answer. Success, I've clicked the, the proper answer, so it tells you right away, and then it gives you a basic um, breakdown of the answer. So if I click continue and say I answer, uh, I'll answer this one randomly. Okay, I got it. I got it wrong. It says you're almost there. Here's a hint. You can view the quick deck, and it's going to tell you what it is, and it's going to give you the basic information of why it's that way. Uh, this is really, really great and uh, in instructional for if you get the question wrong. A lot of programs you'll get the question wrong, and then you won't know what question you got wrong. Um, and there's no way to go back and sort of relearn because you can't see. So this is really great if you get it wrong, it shows you right away. Um, and it's it's really instructional that way and really intuitive to the actual learning that you're doing. Uh, I know we're running um, sort of tight on time here. So I'm just going to go back to the main page here. And it's going to show you also the ebook. So this is our courseware that I was saying is embedded right into the learning. So all of the things that you're learning in the lessons are right here if you need to brush up on your skills before going into the lessons or if you get a few questions wrong and you're like, you know what, I don't really know all of that as well as I'd like to. You can go to the ebooks here and it's got all of the information on the lessons that you're just learning. Um, so it's really, really great. You can come right to it and uh, and see if there's anything that you weren't quite sure on. Uh, it's going to be all in the ebooks. And then the quick decks again is just like um, a referencing tool for definitions for um, different case studies. It's all right here as well. Just a quick deck um, reference. So that's basically what the uh, free lesson of Jasper Active looks like, what it's all about. Um, there's a few different things that you can go in and test out. Um, right now, I'm going to open it back up for questions now. Uh, I know you guys are probably getting sick of my voice, so I will open it up for questions. Um, anything that you guys have asked along the way in the chat, if you want to sort of ask it out loud or if there's any questions that have come up, uh, myself or some of my uh, colleagues here can uh, can help answer those questions for you. Do we have any questions here? You don't need to be shy. We're all very open. There's no wrong questions. Um, whatever comes to mind, if there's anything that uh, that you'd like to uh, to get off your chest, now's the time. Dave, we just have a question in the chat from Paul um, asking about the benchmark, if you want to address that one. Yeah. Let me just uh, pull up the question here. Uh, yeah, of course, there is a, a, an option to skip the benchmark if you don't want to go through it, um, Paul. That's a great question. Uh, the benchmark is there mainly for an assessment of skills. So if you were um, sort of wanting to see where a learner's at in, in their sort of comprehension of this basic knowledge, a benchmark is a great, great way to test that. 
Um, but of course, if um, if you're just wanting uh, your learners to to begin right with the lessons and, and skip the benchmark, uh, of, of course, you're able to do that. Thanks, Dave. Um, and I think the other thing to add with regards to the benchmark is that in the free lesson and the free offer that we've given out for anybody to try, uh, we wanted to give a sort of a really good comprehensive overview, uh, keeping in mind that Jasper Active Digital Literacy is, is uh, broken down into two levels. Um, that benchmark that you're seeing, the benchmark assessment that's 74 questions, covers everything. Uh, but when a learner actually goes in and does a level one, they're only going to see half of that. And you can at any time, as Dave said, choose to turn that function off. Um, so while it may seem a lot, um, that wouldn't typically be what a learner would see. But what we wanted to do is provide sort of the full scope of the instructional design and content within the program from a free access point of view. Yeah, thank you very much, Vanessa. Do we have any other questions that uh, that people are? I know people are a little shy now, but usually we get one person through the door with a question and they all start flooding in. So now's the now's the time for everyone if you have any questions. I did see another question um, from South Africa um, asking how how do I teach um, digital literacy, which is perhaps one of the most difficult courses to teach to somebody who doesn't know what a mouse is, doesn't know what a computer is, doesn't know what the internet is, and how do I do that online? Um, and um, I think uh, completely understood, and I think when we developed uh, Jasper Active Digital Literacy, what we did is uh, not only did we use content that we have developed um, and have been um, very solid in developing, but we consulted with um, highly ex experts, SHMEs, uh, subject matter experts, um, that had a, a really good um, understanding of an instructional design and methodology. And they uh, helped us to develop this in a way that um, by providing access to this online um, and allowing people to do it in the comfort of their own home and with what we call quick clip style lessons, that are highly um, uh, visual. Um, for example, in the uh, computing fundamentals portion of the course, um, it, it takes the time to visually show the learner in that, in that uh, question what a mouse looks like, what a device looks like. And so it's actually uh, providing visual, um, not just textual, but visual idea and understanding of what these devices are. Um, and we have found that that is a great way to engage the learner, regardless of, um, of where they are, not only, but uh, the, what level they're at, um, because they can go through and, um, and learn from the visual components and not just by reading, which we thought was very, very important. Awesome. And I, I mean, I know there's not um, very many questions coming through at this time, but of course, um, if you do have any questions that uh, that come up, uh, you're more than welcome to reach out to any of us. I'm going to put my email in the chat here so that um, if any questions come up after the uh, presentation and you're, and you're like, oh, no, I, I meant to ask this, um, feel free to to um, send me an email or, or send any of our the CCI learning um, team an email here and we'd be more than happy to get back to you on it. Awesome. Well, it, it doesn't seem like there's any uh, any more questions at this time. Uh, I'm going to mute my mic, but uh, I'll hang around for a few more minutes here um, just in case anyone has anything um, late that they want to add or any questions that that come to mind in the next few minutes here. But um, I just want to.
quickly say thank you so much to everybody that um, that joined our webinar and and uh, sat through this with us today. And we really want to also thank Catherine for being a part of this as well and uh, uh, bringing in her efforts and and her words on on sort of Microsoft Microsoft's stance on on digital literacy uh, with the economy as well as um, of their libraries um, sort of strategy moving forward as well. So thank you so much. Um, Catherine and Vanessa for speaking on this and um, we hope to see you all again in our next webinar series um, and if any questions come up over the next few minutes feel free to type them in the chat and I'll I'll stick around for a couple more minutes here. Dave I think Adam had a question um, how does uh, Jazz Proactive link with libraries and museums and uh, I think just to sort of reiterate what we've been talking about over the last hour um, it does a number of things. First of all, it provides uh, a program that libraries and museums can provide to their patrons and community uh, and citizens to ensure that those citizens have the uh, digital literacy skills to be employable, which if you think about a library and a museum um, as a, a, a service provider, um, being able to access and provide those skills to the local community and citizens is um, very, very important. So that's sort of the big link that we have with, uh, with that. It also provides them a way to be sustainable uh, and relevant with regards to providing integration and, and information technology skills for the, for the local community and citizens. Another question here from Paul, um, a great question. Um, IC3 Spark is our sort of version of IC3 for a younger audience. So it's the same, I mean, you could use it as a precursor for uh, JDL, for Jasper Active Digital Literacy, but you're gonna be going over a lot of the same concepts. Um, basically, we, we um, created IC3 uh, Spark as a, um, a user friendly for a younger audience. It's it's more graphic. It's got a lot more pictures. Um, so it's basically it's IC3's content, but it's aimed at a younger audience. So um, you could use it for a precursor, but you'd be going over a lot of the same concepts. Awesome. Well, it looks like those are all the questions for now. I want to just say again, thank you everyone for coming and um, we're, we're so happy to have you on our webinar today. Um, we look forward to future webinars and, and seeing you again. So have a great day and uh, we hope to hear from you again soon.